Okay, so sometimes when things go bad and they end up worse, you might find yourself in the situation where you can't do a traditional uh, arrested landing at the ship. There might be times when you are uncertain if you're going to stop on the on the in the landing area. You might be concerned that uh, you you know it's just not going to work. In which case, you might find that it's appropriate for the ship to rig the barricade. So, what is the barricade? The barricade is basically you still have the wires across the deck. You, but you now have a basically these nylon webbing straps that are vertical, uh, basically like they look like a big giant tennis net that is strung across the landing area. It's it, it, it looks really big when you're standing next to it, and it looks incredibly small probably from the airplane as you're flying in. Now, what might lead the captain of the ship and the air and the and the CAG, mostly the captain, to decide? that it's time to rig the barricade. Well, there's basically a couple of reasons. One, uh, low fuel, and that's a a unique discussion point there, and we could talk about that a little bit, Uh, but also anytime that you believe that the hook point or the hook is damaged or compromised. So here are some scenarios where you might be in a barricade or divert scenario. So the, the idea being that if you have a low pass and your hook uh, or the hook point strikes the round down of the ship prior to the landing area, and then you bolter. You don't know if that hook is compromised, if it's been, if it's experienced a crack, or if it's still working. So you don't know. So you have to take a precaution. Otherwise, if you trap and that thing cracks, now you maybe you risk dribbling off the edge, or maybe even departing the landing area, and then you break other airplanes or even hurt people. So you don't want to do that. So you could have a compromised hook. There are some scenarios where with certain aircraft, depending on the landing gear configuration, like maybe if you have the nose strut down and one of the wing, uh, you know, main gear, but not the other, that you might be in a position where you have to barricade. It's going to depend on the on the situation and the aircraft. Uh, and then the last one is fuel. Now, a lot of times with the low fuel scenario, you say, well, why would you do that? And the, the point is, is that you might have let's say you got 300 pounds of gas, you're on fumes and you have this one pass, even the daytime, you're not going to have enough to come back around for another shot. So if you have a foul deck wave off, wave off winds, or just a bolter from, you know, poor technique or just the low nitrogen pressure on the hook and it skips and you aren't, and you don't catch that wire, you're going to go in the water. So in that case, they might rig the barricade just to make sure that you stop because you're so low on gas that you don't get a second chance. That last one, we're rigging the net and we're going to catch you with the net. So all that being said, there are some unique scenarios where you might rig the barricade. Today, we're going to talk through one of those scenarios and hear how it ended. Hey, before we cut into the episode and start this exciting interview, Crunch and I just want to say thank you to all the people who have contributed, who have responded to our pledge drive request. We've uh, Our funding is in much better shape right now. And thank you for supporting the F-14 Tomcast. On the flight deck, crews are now manning for the next launch. It's time to clear the flight deck and catwalks. Stand well clear of all jet blasts, prop arcs, and exhaust. Time to start up the GO aircraft. Let's start them up. Hey, how you doing? I'm Craig Snyder, call sign Crunch. I was an F-14 pilot and Top Gun instructor, and I'm one of your hosts here for the F-14 Tomcast. Now, the U.S. Navy aircraft perform incredibly demanding aircraft carrier landings routinely, both day and night, in all weather, and a testament to the intense training and high level of skill that all carrier aviators possess is that night landing. Now, backup systems are always in place and are actually put to use in certain very rare circumstances. Now, one of these is the barricade. What is the barricade? It's basically a big giant nylon net that's stored in the flight deck that can be rigged in just a couple of minutes to recover an aircraft as a matter of last resort, but basically only when there are no other options. And I'm Dave Baronic, call sign bio. I was an F-14 Rio and a Top Gun instructor, and I'm your other host for the F-14 Tomcast. Our guests today are a pilot and a Rio who successfully performed one of the few barricade recoveries of an F-14 Tomcat. Pilot Tom Page, callsign Pager, and Rio Rick Jordan, callsign Rico. 
they not only performed a successful barricade, they did it in terrible weather at night with extremely low fuel. This happened in May 1989 during the Indian Ocean deployment of VF-2 aboard the USS Ranger. I'm proud to say I was a squadron mate and I remember the incident very well. Let's meet these guys and hear their story. Pager, Rico, welcome and thanks for being on the F-14 Tomcast. Thank you. Hey, Bio. Good seeing you, man. Hey, Pager. Good to see you again. Let's start with you. Tell us where you're from, how you got commissioned, and how you got into naval aviation. Okay. Uh, from San Jose, California, one of five boys. Uh, one day, my dad, when I was around 12 years old, took us to Moffett Field to watch a Blue Angel air show. And once I saw the Phantoms belching fire and blowing smoke, I was hooked. So uh, a few years later, uh, watching some college football, Army-Navy game came on. My dad said, hey, I think he, if you want to be a Blue Angel, you have to go to the Naval Academy, which is, of course, not true. But he set the hook, and that's the, the path that I took. Ended up graduating from the boat school, got selected for a pilot position. But one of the uh, interesting things is I was uh, had to be put as a stash ensign somewhere before starting flight school for nine months. I ended up going out to a place called Navy Fighter Weapons School, better known as Top Gun, for a nine-month uh, stash ensign job. What year was that? That was uh, 82, uh, June of 82 to March of 83. Got 100 hours of backseat F5 time. Uh, I, I equate it to getting a PhD before going to college. Literally just was a sponge to all those guys. It was great. Uh, ended up uh, going in um, – going to TA-4s in Kingsville, Texas, flew with uh, a guy, Dave Erickson, Trance, was our XO, uh, my first ACM hop, and we get back and he goes, okay, where have you been? What, what's going on? Because you've got the picture. So I, I told him about my stash job, and, and next thing you know, he flies all my ACM hops with me, and at, at the last one, he goes, hey, good news, you're getting fighters, and this is even before the selection, and I was pumped. And uh, he goes, yeah, but first you're going to be one of my sir grads. And, I'm, yeah. and I was devastated. And he said, Pager, when you're going to realize once you get to squadron command, you cherry pick and you stack the deck in your favor. He goes, so work hard for me for 18 months and you'll get to fly whatever you want. Uh, six months later, I became an ACM instructor as a sir grad, which I don't think I've ever heard anyone else doing. And um a year later, I was showing up at Miramar in uh, VF-124. So that's how it all That's started. impressive just for everybody. I mean, that's a surgrad. So you have a no fleet experience. You've been held on as a as a flight instructor, and they made you an ACM instructor as a surgrad. I have never heard of that before. That's amazing. Yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty special. Yeah. There you go. Okay, Rico. Thanks, Pedro. That was perfect. Rico, where are you from? How did you get into aviation, naval aviation and Tomcats? Well, I don't have anything as interesting as Pager, obviously, but I grew up in Concord, North Carolina. As Pager used to make fun of me, a product of the North Carolina public school system. <laughs> he used to say that a lot. Anyway, went to school at UNC. And uh, my junior year is when the two VF-41 Tomcats shot down the Libyans. You know, I didn't have good eyesight, so I wasn't planning on, I knew I couldn't be a pilot. And that's when I started reading about the F-14 and found out about the Rio job. Back in the day, we had to read Time Magazine or Newsweek to figure out what was going on. And I thought, well, maybe I'll go do that. A uh, An officer recruiter came to campus not long after that. I went and saw him, and I was off and running. Went to AOCS in March of 1983 and commissioned in June of 83. So when you joined the fleet, where'd you go? I was a Phantom Rio. I was the last Phantom Rio in the Navy. So that oh, just that's means I, wasn't, cool. I wasn't first in my class. So I was the last, the last Adam Rio. And I went to VF 161 on the Midway. So I ended up getting about 450 Phantom hours and 125, 130 traps. So as a JG, and then I transitioned, the detailers came out, came out, I'm sorry, halfway through that uh, tour and I got orders to VF 194, brand new squadron in CAG 10, uh, and was off to Miramar. 
So, you know, those guys stood up and stood down a year, and then I got orders to VF2 in 1988. All right, cool. Awesome. Crunch, don't you think? Don't you think these guys are going to be uh, quite a pair of, of all the well, guests? I, we've had? I think they might be. I was trying to put a little joke in there, Rico. You know, you said you uh, got those phantoms because you weren't first in your class. I was going to say, you know, a special thanks to the North Carolina public school system there. For, <laughs> there you go, that. absolutely. Got your phantom yeah, spot. Good, Crunch. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. The guy who was going to be last went med down, so he wouldn't be last. And I think there were two of us. So they gave uh, the first guy Tom Cats, and then. I got the last phantom slot. But you know what? I'm very happy that that happened. Oh, yeah. No kidding. I'm happy. Have phantom, yeah. Have that phantom experience. You know, this crunch, we hear stories like this from our guests, guys who work the system and, and to yeah. get something or to miss something. So makes me feel inadequate that I didn't work the system more. I feel like maybe, <laughs> I mean, I'd have been an admiral if I'd worked it as hard as these guys did. <laughs> Holy cow. But, but hey, so, um, so you guys start. So, uh, Rico, you said you're in phantoms. What squadron was that? A VF-161, the Rock Rivers. Oh, okay. Got it. All right. And then, so you were still in that first tour, first JO tour when you transitioned Top Cats. Is that right? Did that squadron transition? Was, I was only over there a year and they transitioned to Hornets and put us Rios out of a job. So I got the orders to VF-194 in Miramar where they were standing up the two new Tomcat squadrons. Crunch, so 191 around. and 194 were only around less than two years, I think, like Rico said. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. And then, uh, and so then how did you find yourself in the bullets VF2? What happened? After uh, that? I picked which squadrons just came back from deployment and said, I want to go there. Smart. So, so you worked the system. Got it. All right. I worked <laughs> and, then, uh, and, and Pedro, how about you? How'd you find yourself in VF2 at that time? Uh, mine was the exact opposite experience. Uh, I go through the rag and, uh, because of my sur grad experience, I had a little over a thousand hours um, and it did pretty well at the boat, uh, won the hook. And uh, unbeknownst to me, they, they give you a list and I did the same thing. I, I picked all the squadrons that um, had just gotten back. So I wanted a full workup. And yeah. uh, OPSO calls me in and says, hey, uh, you're going to VF2. They're leaving on cruise in a week. Uh, I had to finish up. Uh, I think it was... Uh, air refueling and I had to go to Sears school. And so I literally put my, uh, got a, a bag together, put it on the ship, met a couple of the guys. I knew a couple of the guys from school. Uh, I go to Sears school and as soon as they're leaving the PI, uh, I go to Diego Garcia and I'm flown in, uh, on a a US three to, uh, say hi and meet the guys. Uh, Awesome. Yeah. So, so crunch later on, we, we can, uh, we may get back to this, but I remember when pager showed up in VF2 in the middle of, you know, early during the deployment and I was his first regular schedule Rio. Oh yeah. He, he flew at the XO for a few times and then I was assigned as his Rio and, uh, and he did a lot, he did a good job. So, so that was the 1987 deployment. Correct. But, but, uh, I mean, we can, we can tell cruise stories, but you want to get to the barricade? Crunch. Yeah, absolutely. I a hundred percent, which is, which is in 1989, right? Yes. Okay. Right. So, so that's, and that's one thing that I was thinking of as we were talking, as, as I was thinking about this. So by the barricade incident comes during pagers second deployment. And then for Rico, had you made a complete deployment? I mean, you had a, you had a good amount of fleet experience, but it was your first full real deployment, right? Well, I made an IO deployment in, oh, okay. uh, on Midway. So it was my first Tomcat deployment. All right. So by the time in um, in 1989, May 89, Pedro, how many hours? Do you remember how many hours and traps you had in Tomcats? And, and then we'll get to Rico. I probably had 650 hours in the Tomcat. Traps-wise, I... I, I I ended up with 236 total. And I think, so I probably had maybe a couple hundred at that point. Yeah, man, you were a bagger. All right, way to go. (laughs) And so Rico, you you didn't have many Tomcat traps at that time, did you? No, I didn't. I probably had uh, 400 Tomcat hours and 
when I got the VF2, probably, well, we kind of done a full workup. So I probably had over a hundred. So you guys are not, you're not inexperienced. I would say that at a hundred traps, you know, you know, what's going on around the boat, 200 traps as a pilot, you certainly got the, the system down. I mean, you probably had 80 to a hundred night traps at that point. It's probably fair to say that, you know, I remember at about that point, you're still, you can still be nervous or excited or competitive all at the same time at that level. Cause you're still working through all the bugs of being stinking awesome behind the boat, but you're, you're solid enough that you know what you're doing. Is that fair? Yeah. I, I think for, for me, I had already gone through Top Gun as a student. Um, well, twice now since you, you know, exactly. Right. Exactly. And, uh, was going to be taken over pilot training officer. I think halfway through cruise, uh, was one of the senior JOs. So I, I felt confident in my abilities and, uh, yeah, nothing around the boat really was uh, unusual until yeah. until the <laughs> until the night in question. <laughs> so, how far into deployment was this, and where where were you? What was going halfway. on? How far into deployment were you at this point? I think we were halfway. I think we left in January or getting back in August, so we're about halfway. Yeah, gotcha. Somewhere in there. In in this is in the IO, or where was this? It is in the IO. Okay. Okay, So what kind of flying had we been doing? Uh, So I I remember the 89 cruise, we didn't do any earnest will. I think they had already terminated that program. We were just patrolling off Iran, right? And just practicing strikes and doing random cap flights. I mean, it wasn't very challenging, was it? Just normal, low-key peacetime deployment. That's it. Correct. You remember any highlights or uh, anything special that we had done or <laughs> not really, huh? No. A boring Never. cruise in the middle of the Indian Ocean. There okay. you go. Not like you guys had done the cruise before. Right. Was- cruise before was had more incidents and a little bit more exciting flying. Okay, so so at the time of the uh, barricade, hold on, hold on, you can't just throw that out there and keep rolling. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> are we oh, going to no. have to have another episode to talk about something crazy? No, it's the, the cruise before the eighty-seven cruise when we did uh, twenty-four hour ops for you know forty-eight hours, seventy-two hours continuous oh, okay. flying. Sounds familiar to something that you and I did. Uh, was that on the Nimitz? Yeah, if yeah. I remember right, a few yeah, years later. Yep. Yeah. But we also uh, some air wing squadrons lost some airplanes and and stuff like that. So, uh, but in the eighty nine cruise, much more uh, stable. So, had you guys been? Were you a regularly paired crew at this time? When I first got to VF two, I was paired up with Pager, and we did some workups and we did FARP together, and maybe even Fallon. I don't remember Fallon, but fighter derby, fighter derby, the eighteen. Right? <laughs> there you go. So for people, anybody that's uh, not sure, uh, FARP is the Fleet Fighter ACM Readiness Program. Okay. So you guys right. have flown together some. So now we're out on the deployment. Right. And and you, and you Rico, who were you flying with? you remember? Uh, I can't remember. His call sign was Chud, but I can't remember his name. Oh, I remember. Him. I may have even been moved to the floater position. Oh, yeah. So fly with anybody. I, I don't remember. But... Uh, I remember Pedro and I were not a a crew then. And like I said earlier, I wasn't, I'm surprised I got that flight. Go ahead. uh, How'd that happen? So this is, this is a good time to start moving into the flight. All right. Well, it's like the day before, uh, one of the Rios we had in our squadron who was uh, very talkative was complaining about how the skipper had been flying more than anybody else. And uh, making, uh, we were making conversation, not realizing that he was setting up in the front and the <laughs> CEO's chair kind of slouched down so you couldn't see him. And then he pops up and he goes, wait a minute, you guys, uh, you know, oh no, Skipper, everything's good. We're good. And then the next day, <laughs> when I looked at the schedule, I was on there twice. And the night flight with Pager was uh, the eventful one of the day. And, so, I mean, so it worked everybody, out perfectly. 
worked out. Yeah, but yeah. we don't want. I don't want people to get the wrong idea. You know, that's not punishment. That's that's the skipper going. Okay, fine. This guy was complaining. I'll fix that right now. I'll give him a couple of flights. You know, it wasn't me that started the complaining, but I don't want to say the person's name. We can say slush. Unless you want me to. That slush. Half the fleet knows him anyway. So. Okay, yeah, slush. Okay. <laughs> okay, so. In fact, I don't know if every squatter did this, but they were tracking the Rio traps up on the greenie board, too, in VF2, that, that deployment. So. Mm. The runaway. So what was your, uh, what was your assigned mission on this flight? You remember? Was it? Was it nighttime intercept practice? Were Night, you capping? Night, nighttime intercept. Pretty mundane. Basically, stay right. current. You know, uh, so crunch. The, from the pilot side. Crunch for, for you, because crunch, most of your Tomcat cruises were either combat or you probably got green ink on all your deployments. Uh, no, the first couple were, well, no, the first one. But it was Southern not. Watch. Even Southern Watch was green ink. I, I mean, uh, back yeah, in the 80s. Back in the eighties, we would fly around and we would just, you know, it was really low, low stress. You just go out and fly, you know? Yeah. Well, I did have, we did have some period of, you know, low stress, just go out, get current, stay night current, go pull into port and have a good time. But, uh, that was earlier in my career. Later was punishment at sea. <laughs> yeah. I don't think Pedro had flown at night for like five days or so. So that was get him current hop. Yeah. Yeah, because you have to you have to have a night trap every seven days or six. I can't. I think it was every seven days in order to be current. That's right. Okay, so so Pager, tell us uh, why don't you start us off uh, the barricade incident? That flight, the whole flight. How did how did you find yourself in that situation? Well, we uh, you know briefed the the AIC hop, walk out to the jet, and it's it's pouring rain and. Uh, Rico jumps in. I do a quick pre-flight. We're both soaked. And the chatter immediately starts because we're seeing thunder and lightning in all quadrants. So we're thinking this, this flight's not going to go. It's going to be a kank uh, pretty much. Uh, we're, we're probably trying to talk ourselves into that. Um, sure enough, they start breaking us down and uh, it's like, oh, are, are they respotting us? Or are they, are we really going? And sure enough, so breaking us down, taking off the chains, getting me ready to taxi, getting us ready to taxi, and off we go to uh, to the cat. And it's like, okay, well, as the old saying goes, you can't buy training like this, fellas. I mean, this is the real deal, you know. So we launch off the front end, and I don't know if Rico remembers, but as soon as I get the gear up, I the locks bottle must have. Uh, connection must have uh, disconnected because I am sucking no air at all. So immediately gear up, mask comes down and it just becomes one of the, it, that's almost like it sets the tone for, this is a, kind of annoying. It's not a big deal. I'm just going to keep track of uh, cabin pressure, make sure that stays under control, but mask is off uh, and off we go. And I don't know about you, Rico, but I remember when we're flying through that, uh, you know, the thunderstorm getting tossed around like a rag doll pretty good. Um, right. I've never been tossed around like that before. No, it was uh, it was pretty violent. Um, you know, our radar doesn't pick up weather and we're going out to station and we break we break clear of the clouds. And it's like, oh, my God, that that was unbelievable. The whole time going through my head is we have to come back through this eventually. And hopefully in the hour, hour, 10, 15 minutes, the ship's going to find some clear air, or, you know, get away from this weather system. That's basically over the carrier. And we're not even almost out to the station before we get the call. Hey guys, come on back. Uh, basically almost uh, weather's not getting any better. Let's, let's come on back now and, and uh, recover you. So, so the recovery is, was, early correct yeah they they right. they pushed it up a good 45 minutes to an hour no problem so you go back to the ship yeah come back to the ship yeah you know we're blue water ops there's nowhere else to go dump right? fuel that we don't want to dump. and that's the thing that's the, the the part that um all the little hairs on the back of the neck start to stand up as i reach for the dump handle or the dump switch and you know we got to get down to max strap weight 
So I have to end up dumping six, 7,000 pounds of gas and again, getting tossed around pretty good uh, coming back to the ship. And I believe, if I remember correctly, we were the first ones down the chute. Um, Ooh. Yeah. So yeah, we didn't go to the Marshall stack. They just sent us straight to final, vectored us to final. Yeah. So, okay, man, that is, that's, this is, it's like everything is unusual about this flight. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so I remember, uh, dirtying up, we're still in the goo and, um, still getting tossed around pretty good and I'm working hard, you know, keeping the needles on and on. And we finally start to break out and I, and I give a little, you know, little cheat look and I don't see anything. So I'm back down working the, you know, the needles. And okay. So that means you look out of the cockpit. You're, you're yeah, flying yeah. on instruments. And- you know, little sugar look. You want to make sure, you know, okay, the, you see something out there and, and, and I don't. And that uh, was a little unusual because by that time, uh, you know, you'd, you'd see it, you know, the drop down lights or, you know, the, the ball and, and nothing. So back down and uh, come in and they give us a three quarter mile, call the ball. And I come out, look again, Clara, back down. Now I'm starting to get a little, little antsy because uh, we're out of the clouds and I should be seeing something. And then I come out again and I get a glance out of the left forward windscreen. I see something over there and the ship is 45 degrees off my nose because we are we are we are coming in in a crab and that's never happened before to me so i go ahead and make a play and paddles just gives me the wave off lights and we wave off come to find out later lso uh squadron lso's on the plat tells me after the fact that the winds were 45 degree 40 to 50 degrees off the off the angle and around 40 to 50 knots. So there was no way I was going to come in and uh, and trap. But unbeknownst to me, I thought everything was squared away. And no, go ahead and take low holding. And so we clean it up and get to 1,500 feet. And now, it's a, now it becomes basically a waiting game. Rico, you want to jump in and... Yeah, from there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. From there, we just go to low holding. It seems like we're there forever because, I mean, we're in low holding so long that we get low fuel life. And I think that at that point, it's like, okay. So a little was, interesting. The, was the recovery continuing? No. What, what they were doing, Bio, is they were now – it. I got the sense that there was a bunch of helmet fires happening. They were, they were now launching maxi tankers. And they're taking uh, two fighters with a tanker uh, going to Masira, which was, I think, around five, six hundred miles away. So they're they're realizing that the the box that they had built was not a good box. And they kind of just put us, you know, we're in low holding. We're now low priority because uh, they've got a plan going and they're they are starting to execute that plan. So they want to divert as many airplanes as they can. Correct. That that was our sense. And and for Rico and I, you know, there was a couple of times where he came up and it's like, hey, uh, you got you got a plan for us? Uh, yeah. Uh, Two one standby. Okay. We got you. We're, we'll get to you. Okay. Sounds good. But when you start to see the low fuel lights coming on at night, uh, you know, and you don't really have a hear your call sign in the plan as of yet, uh, you know, we we were talking a little bit back and forth about. You know what? What really is going on here? Okay, so let's let's add a little perspective. I mean, you guys in the cockpit knew this. I, we all knew this when we were flying. Uh, I don't remember when the low fuel light came on. Do you remember what fuel level it is? I I can pull my natops out and check. But two thousand pounds. I think That's it's two thousand pounds. Is is a is a guess. Okay, so if you have two low fuel lights, you got four thousand pounds, right? That means less than one hour of flying. At at best case, 
And those fuel in the fuel gauge in the Tomcat was not known for its accuracy. So you Correct. could have you could have 30 minutes to 45 minutes of flying, probably. All right. So there you go. You got low fuel lights. Rico's saying, what about us? What happens next? I think Pager knows the S3 pilot, and we just kind of right? He just yeah. kind of comes over and gives us a thousand pounds of gas. What what happens is uh T- Timmy, Timmy Schaefer, uh, call sign Shaft, is up. Uh, they launched him, and he was giving gas to to somebody else. And he comes up on the radio and says, I got 1,000 pounds to give. And I, I want to say at this point, Rico, we were down to around 2,000 pounds of gas. Oh, and, and, uh, and Rico couldn't say, we'll take it quick enough. I mean, he was like white on rice. He was like, We'll take it where you at. So we got coordinated the position. We go ahead and and joined onto Timmy and uh, took his thousand pounds. And things started to. I was feeling a little bit more comfortable now because as I'm in the basket uh, getting the gas, Rico says, "Hey, we got an A6 maxi tanker joining on us right now." So I kind of settle into the seat, going, "Okay, this is this is working out. We're going from." being ignored to now we've got two tankers we're gonna we're gonna take all we can out of the s3 we do and then we come out of the basket pass the lead over the a6 he lets his his drogue come out and we go ahead and tap him okay so a6 maxi tanker was either it was probably maybe a ka6 with it was five external five external tanks so he could give you know whatever, 15,000 pounds or more. So he can give you all you need. Correct. Yeah. But you guys, all right, this is almost over. Cool. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm feeling really good at this point. Uh, but we're at 1500 feet again, weather is, is a big concern now. It's, it's the most challenging tanking I've ever done in and out of clouds, uh, you know, turbulent and in crunch, you know, uh, when you're trying to fly formation on an airplane in the goo that's moving around, that's challenging. You, you, you try to fly formation on a little basket with one light working. That's pretty challenging in and of itself. Yeah. Um, so go ahead and uh, plug the A6 and he comes up and says, yeah, I, I don't, I don't see you in the basket. Like, oh, I'm, I'm in, but okay. So unplug hit him again. And, uh, he goes, yeah, I don't see any flow. And Rico's verifying that he's like, we're not getting any gas. And now we're probably down to, we've already burned through most of the thousand pounds that, that shaft has given us. And, and unbeknownst to me, the, the a six in the effort to try to find smooth air and clear the clouds had basically gone wings level and he's taken us away from the ship. So by the time, <clears throat> excuse me, by the time uh, he comes up on the second time and says, yeah, I'm not showing any flow at all. So uh, I go, okay, well I have to unplug and this one is not going to be any, any doubt I'm in the basket. So I go ahead and with a little bit more ramming speed, hit it. Hoping that the sine wave of that of that uh, fuel you know hose doesn't come back and rip my probe off, but we're in the basket. No, no questions asked. We're there, and then he comes up and says, "It looks like we're sour," and uh, it's like, "Oh, okay, that's that now changes everything." At that point, I remember I told him to recycle one more time. Uh-huh. So he pulls the basket in, recycles it, and the whole thing just came out and went into the ocean. The, whole, <laughs> everything. the hose, the basket, everything just detached from the airplane? It just detached and went into the ocean. So it's kind of like, this is great. Val- validation that, uh, either, you know, it definitely wasn't working. And, and I don't know, maybe it was my third – Hit. I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Low fuel lights are coming on again right at that point. Well, yeah, no, we're we're down to around fifteen hundred pounds at this point, and we're thirty to thirty-five miles away from the ship. 
Oh man. <laughs> yeah. And it's at this point that it's like, okay, we start to turn back and CAG comes up and goes, uh, two to one, we're going to have to barricade you. And total, total disbelief. And, and I, yeah. again, I, I don't have my mask on. I have to be talking as I'm flying, you know, bringing it over. And I'm like, uh, Hey, Kag, I, I couldn't see the the deck, on, and he's and he's like, hey, hey, no, 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 you, you hit the number, we got to barricade you. You know, it's just a, you know, a SOP. You hit a certain fuel state, we just have to get this done. It's like, right, okay. So, and, and the, all this, I mean, the last time you came around, you went wave off for winds, foul deck for winds because they were so out of limits. Correct. And for our listeners, the crosswind component for a normal landing is no greater than if I'm not mistaken, seven knots, you're aiming for less than two to three, seven knots, 10 knots waverable up for the, at the ship CO. And for a barricade, I want to say it's even less like three knots or something like that. It is really, really tight. So you've already waved off for winds being out of limits when it was wider. And now we're going to need, make it even tighter for an even harder pass. Correct. Yeah. Wow. So I was, I mean, like I said, I was in the squadron and we're down there and, you know, we're just aware that there's airplanes flying and, and it's like, it's routine. I mean, you, you know, you, you know how that is. Nobody really cares or maybe you'll be watching, but when they said barricade, the word just spread and all the VF2 people came into the, uh, into the red room is my recollection. Uh, I don't remember who our Catsy rep was. Do you guys... <laughs> It wasn't the skipper, was it? That would be that would have been ironic. I don't remember. It might have been sad. Yeah, I don't remember talking to any squadron catsy rep at all during this whole yeah. evolution. You know what? It sounds like there was no room for them to get in. It's like there's so yeah. much going on, and then all of a sudden you guys are in the barricade number and okay. Yeah. All right. So so uh, uh let's go a little bit more and then we'll watch the video. Okay. So anyway, uh, as soon as we get the, you know, the call from CAG, then uh, Steve Daly, our CAG paddles, uh, comes up on the horn and starts briefing us on barricade operations. Don't take your own way of off in close. Uh, he asks, he goes through a litany of asking questions, you know, what's wrong with the jet, this, that, kind of getting a, a feel for the mindset and, and then says, okay, we're going to, Give you the cut, 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 pass, and close. We're going to target the one wire. Um, just pretty much a standard, I guess, uh, barricade brief from LSO school. You know, they probably read off. And okay, so so what's a cut, 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 pass, real quick before we get oh, too far? Yeah. So normally, we all know that when you touch down, you go to full power. Uh, make sure you got the. Uh, tug on the wire and you don't spit a wire and you can go around and bolter. Well, when the barricade's up, there's no opportunity to do that. You're not going to go to full power. You actually want to decel as quickly as possible. So my understanding was that they went ahead and, and changed the glide path on the, uh, the lens to target the one wire. And I'm not sure if they did that via Movilis with the LSOs uh, doing it by hand or if, if they could do it automatically i'm not sure but he just said we're going to target the one wire and when we call cut 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 you're going to go to idle uh which is against everything we've learned in carrier aviation but you know it's they they briefed it enough we talked about it so uh pretty pretty confident i wasn't going to go full power okay so pedro you went from uh, disbelief you already said that as soon as they said the b word you you were in a state of disbelief and now you're getting briefed up on the specifics of this unusual pass. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. And so Rico, I'm going to come to you in just a second, but Pager, as this is going, are you starting to go, are you starting to feel more comfortable or less comfortable? It, it, it's interesting, Bio, because, uh, you know, after the fact, people were going like, oh man, you, you got to pull the seat cushion out from your ass. You, you probably had such a pucker factor. And it really wasn't that at all. I mean, it, it was almost like a laser focus. Yeah. Uh, the whole time when we were waiting for the gas, that was that was kind of time to think. And, and the more time you think, you can you know have crazy thoughts coming in your head. But once we started doing the uh, the tanking at night, 
Uh, it was, I mean, that was varsity big boy pants on uh, stuff because it was get in or you're going to, you know, jump out of the jet. So kind of laser focused on that. And then once we got behind the ship, it was just business, you know, all business and pretty much uh, no distractions, really. Okay, very good. So, Rico, what are you thinking, uh, you know, as you're getting when when CAG starts saying barricade and stuff like that? What are you thinking as? uh... You know, I just pulled out the pocket checklist and we just went through the barricade checklist. Oh, you there know, is a barricade one. checklist. Okay, cool. There's a barricade, but we didn't do every step. You know, I didn't jettison the tanks. I didn't punch off the ordnance because I didn't think that would, you know, I knew my pilot was going to get me back on the ship. So we weren't going to do those things. And so once we started getting back and you can actually see the ship, then oh, oh, we're in there. We're good to go. Even though we're low fuel, we'll be good to go. So. And Bio, I, I got to say one thing in regards to Rico. Uh, nobody better than to have a guy like Rico who is, as they say, as cool as the other side of the pillow. I mean, no stress, no, I mean, just his voice, calm, the demeanor. It was like, let's get this shit done and let's go get a slider. You know, that was basically the mindset. And for, for Pilot, it's... And bio, you were the same way. Well, no, 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 I'm, I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say that. But I, I will agree with you. I mean, because I was the opso. I was an 04 at this time, or or I was almost the opso. So I was a senior guy, and I do remember around the squadron, Rico was pretty effing cool, especially as a junior Rio. So that's good. I believe it. Yeah, Rico, we never told you that, did we? <laughs> Good, Pager. That's yeah. excellent. I didn't even think we were having an emergency until I heard Pager get a little excited when he said, you got to take me now after they spun us the second time. Yeah. Okay. So, go ahead. Go ahead. And ahead of ourself, I guess. Put, no, put us to that point and then we'll watch the video. Okay. So Pager, you're thinking you're getting ready to come in and do the barricade. We're coming in. We got the brief and we, we dirty up and, um, I don't know, three, four miles. We can see the ship. They've found kind of a clear area, but they're still looking to try to get final bearing uh, tightened up. So uh, they come up and they say, hey, why don't you give us a give us a 360? We're, we're, we're still rigging the barricade. So it's like, okay. So we go ahead and we're, I think, at 1,200 pounds at this point, and uh, we do our 360, and uh, now we're back in – on final bearing, and uh, they, I think we're probably three miles, and they go, hey, w- just give us one more 360. And right around that time, uh, Pag comes up and asks uh, Rico, say your fuel state. And <laughs> he's Rico, in just his North Carolina way, and it's almost like a disgusted, 900 pounds, almost like saying, are you kidding me? You're making us go do another 360. We got to get on deck now. So right around that time, again, I'm, I'm distracted with the, the mask kind of dangling. I look over, I see the fuel tapes are pretty low, plus or minus two to 300 pounds fuel gauge error. We're at a thousand pounds. That really could mean we're maybe at 500 pounds. Um, so at that point, I tell Rico, uh, take your kneeboard off, stow it, cinch your straps down, and I'm going to fly this. I give him a quick what-if brief, and I said, hey, I'm going to continue flying this thing. So this is this is preparation for potential ejection. Exactly, yeah. For listeners I, who, do, who don't. Yeah. So I, I just said, hey, hey bud, uh, clear everything off, tighten your straps. I'm going to continue to fly this thing. My communication is such that, you know, I can, I can uh, use the ICS uh, switch and it's going to get a lot of static, but I'm just going to yell, eject, eject, eject. If, and I'm going to continue flying, you're going to punch us out because it, once you get behind the ship, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that if I needed to, if I felt the, you know, the motors losing power that I could steer it away and not hit the back of the ship or, 
whatever the case may be. I, I just said, Hey, you're going to, you're going to punch us out. And, and then that's when I came up after that brief and I just kind of leaned over and said, you got to take us now because they were giving us a call. Hey, uh, extend a little bit. And we're, we're still working on the final bearing and, and I'm looking at basically no fuel gauges, you know, no tape almost. Yeah. And I just said, Hey, okay. you got to take us now. We'll, we'll take whatever you've got and we'll make it happen. Okay, that call is just, I mean, that is like lightning cutting through the situation when you guys said that. Okay, so let's let's watch the video. So we'll take a quick break here. We're going to insert this video. Yeah, and you probably want to remember that once you're in a barricade, you don't want to eject, obviously. We know. We're getting a little back to it right now. Yeah, looking real good. Go ahead and give me one more 360 here, Tom. The barricade's not ready yet. It's still working 27 knots and it's about a 20 degrees port now. Let's say your state. As you gotta take me this time. Say again. Yeah, just go to 1.2 there. What's your state, 200? 900 pounds. Zero, sir. I've got radar on you. Wings level at danger. Squad six in the turn. Report steady on the downwind heading of uh, one eight Christian. Uh, three five zero. Three five zero. I'm not going to take it up wind very long. Come on. Now the turn in matters your discretion. Mother's in a poor turn now. Stand by for the expected fall bearing. So you guys had to do 360s. What, what's going on? What's going on on the flight deck that you needed to delay? We didn't know it at the time, but apparently they had rigged the barricade upside down. So they had to re-rig the barricade, and that was slowing everything down right there. Yeah, so. I can only imagine. So the Airboss is up there, and he says, this is your five-minute warning to rig the barricade. They move Tilly out. Get Tilly out in the front. Everybody's open. The stan- they're getting the stanchion ready to go. Everybody's in place. They're all lined up. They say, now rig the barricade. Put out the little things, hook it up, and put it up, and they're supposed to do it in, uh, I believe it's a, a minute and a half. Yeah. Two minutes? 
Yeah, I thought, okay. So that's where the, I'm an air boss. Why would I know these things? But uh, you get it up and, uh, and that's what it is. Now, if all of a sudden you find it's upside down, you're going to have to basically undo that and redo it. And oh, by the way, because you pulled it out, it's, it's stowed ready to go. It's kind of like a parachute in the sense that it's packed ready to go. So they hook it to a tractor and pull it out. Obviously they messed it up. It's probably going to take four or five minutes to undo that and redo it. I can only imagine how long that took. So you're doing three sixties up there because they're down there monkeying around with the, with the net and trying to figure that thing out. So they finally get it going. Do they finally get it hooked up properly or is it like, Hey, it's good enough. Let's bring them. As far as we know, they got it proper. Okay. Yeah. So, so Rico, what do you, you, I know you've watched that video now and then, what do you think when you watch that? Do you, can you go back to that moment or? Yeah, I just remember at that point, you know, I, I didn't think we had an emergency going until I heard Pager come up and say, you got to take us now. And I thought, uh-oh, if Pager's excited, maybe I should be excited. And then we made that last 360 and we just flew our own pattern behind the ship. I wasn't going to listen to what anybody told us to do. We were just going to fly our own VFR pattern behind the ship. Pager did a tremendous job just making a great 360 and, and putting it right on center line as we came in. So I knew he was going to do that. No problem. <laughs> Pager, you do you can you go back to that? I mean, or were you just feeling like like you said, you were laser focused, you were mission focused? Yeah, it it, it really just uh I don't, I don't want to say it was like any other pass because it wasn't, but it was just, uh, I knew I had a job to do, did it the best I could. And, um, yeah, it all, it all worked out. But it is cool that you think about, uh, you, that you said earlier, you were thinking, I don't want to hit the ship and your brain is working so fast. You have time to take, to consider these other thoughts and then, you know, consider them and move on and get back to work and all that. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because, you know, sometimes when things happen in a jet and you, you suddenly, you know, your IQ goes to single digits. It's like, whoa, what's going on? The exact other end of the spectrum is you get so focused and hyper aware of things that yeah. um, and, and, and there's no, really no telling which, you know, what's going to happen. I mean, that's one of a testament to our training is that we practice and do things over and over and over and work on things. And we expect excellence every pass. And, and that's why we're critical of how we do things that you almost fall back into just ops normal. Really? Okay. You, you just set me up for something I was going to say. I heard this from uh, Willie Driscoll, the famed F4 and F14 Rio. He says that uh, people, a lot of people hope that in crisis, they will rise to the level of performance needed. But he said, what really happens is you fall to the level of your training. And so, as you said, naval aviation is, you know, intense in training. So, um, so how was the LSO? You, who was the, the, uh, your, the CAG LSO? CAG paddles was uh, Steve Daly, call sign Steve. And then uh, Mad Dog McLaughlin was his. Oh, I remember Mad Dog also. Yeah. Yeah. And and they're great. They you know un unflappable and uh, just solid. Uh, yeah, they they did a did a great job. I did call the ball with six zero instead of six hundred pounds, so that was my because uh, <laughs> I wasn't used to calling six hundred pounds on the ball. So I just looked and saw six and said, "Yeah, <laughs> you know." Once we trapped, uh, the first guy to the jet was uh, Munch Lathrop, our our maintenance officer. Yeah. And uh, after, you know, we were getting ready to k jump out, he's like, uh, hey, I'm going to have I'm going to have the guys uh, defuel the airplane and see how much fuel you had left. And I'm like, <laughs> I, I don't I don't want to know that much. I, <laughs> please. No. And he saw me in the, re the ready room later and uh, said 90 seconds. You had around 90 seconds worth of flying time. It's like, wow. <laughs> wow. God. And 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 while we're in the ready room, uh, you know, I'm, I'm basically writing up a, a report while it was fresh on my, my brain. CAG came in, congratulated both Rico and I. And first of all, he looked very old. And I mean, it was a very stressful night, probably more for him than it was for us. Yeah, because he diverted half of his air wing. Exactly. Half, but. And, and what really 
it, it crystallized how big of a deal this was when he said, do you know how close I was to having you just pull up alongside the ship and, and ejecting? And I'm like, no, no, sir, I did not. And I'm, and I'm very happy you didn't do that uh, because that's the last thing I want to do is to give away a perfectly good airplane, you know, that I signed for. And, uh, you know, so anyway. Okay. So, so let's go back to the past. You're on the ball. Rico, you look like you got something on your mind, so don't lose that thought. But Pedro, you're on the ball. You're flying the ball. Is it you're flying the ball normally, or do you have a lot of noise in your brain, or are you telling yourself things, or just flying the ball? I'm just I'm just flying the ball. No noise. No, I mean we've already briefed possible ejection parameters and whatnot. Uh, it's it was basically again business as normal. Fly the ball, get it on deck, and I, and I know. And then I'm going through my brain that we're going to go cut, cut, cut and go to idle. That was really the only extraneous thought I had was, was that. So when do you see the net? I didn't see the, the barricade until we literally touched down. We caught the one wire and then suddenly, you know, it, it's like if somebody's going to hit you in the face and you just kind of react, there's something that just enveloped the, the canopy. And we were already slowing down at that point. So it happened kind of instantaneously. That's the only time I saw it. And once we were stopped, that was uh, that was it. Rico, how about you? Did you see the net as you're coming in? I mean, the, the barricade itself. Uh, no, I didn't. I wasn't looking. I just remember ducking when it went over the canopy, though, uh, for whatever reason. I don't know. Why. Reflex. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then once we... We stopped. I just remember looking out to the right, looking up at the island, and it's just covered with people. I mean, everybody's wanting to come out and see the Tomcat crash, right? I mean, it's just, I've never seen that many people. I think it, it, it's, it's like a it's war like NASCAR. Yeah, when they signed the, the treaty on the Missouri, it was just people hanging everywhere on the side of the ship. So, now, you, you for our listeners, you know, um, you got to imagine you're coming in, your approach speed's probably about 140 knots or so, right? Coming right. in, um, you're, you're hitting the w- one wire. So you caught the hook, which is intended, you know, you'd prefer to catch the hook and the barricades. Uh, it's a backup. It's a just in case. And it's there in case you bolter, you're in a low fuel state. We know that we're going to eject. So that's why we're doing this. Now, what about damage to the airplane? So now you've caught the hook, but you're still going to get all this force in the airplane. Do you know how long it was until the airplane flew again? I, I think that the, the damage was pretty minimal. Um, the I, I want to say it was flying a couple weeks later. Rico, do you remember? I think it was probably at least a month because I had to fly a special team out to fix it because it messed up the slats. Okay. The uh, slats got messed up. Yeah. And it may have tore a probe off the side too. Fortunately, it didn't go down the intake or anything, but... <laughs> But I think the slats got messed up pretty good. So I think it's about a month, something like yeah. that. All right. Crunch, we need to put the bureau number on our uh, – we'll put the bureau oh, yeah. number up. Do you guys have that right now, the bureau number? We'll look it up. We'll look it up and put yeah. it up. All right. Go ahead. So I was going to say that's a good point because, you know, you land and that big net's out there. The nose of the airplane basically goes through it, and the stuff that actually catches it is pretty much the wings you know, are catching it. So it makes sense that the the slats are going to take some damage and, you know, and everything just, uh, you go into it, you're at idle. And then of course you shut down right away, right? Shut Mm -hmm. the engines down. And then, you know, you try to open the canopy. Was it obstructed? I mean, was there anything hard to get out or? No, all the, all the net was behind us at the wing. So the canopy came up. Okay. Gotcha. And obviously you guys were the last recovery. There's no other airplane coming in behind you, fixed wing. All they had to do was bring in the helicopter and land it somewhere else. So do you, I mean, how long does it take to clean up after a barricade arrestment? Do you know? I mean, this is, I've never even thought about that until now. I'm like, I don't even know. I have no idea. Me either. I mean, you're, you're like, I'm sitting in the ready room, hoping for a slider talking to CAG. I do not have any idea. Absolutely. And, and, and funny too, the, uh, our schedule officer came up to me uh, after CAG left and he's like, Hey, uh, do you want to fly tomorrow? And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, absolutely. I want to fly tomorrow. And so who was, was it? Was it Bing Goober or it was, it was Bing. Bing. And um, 
so uh, first of all, I'm, I'm looking forward to a little medicinal brandy, and, uh, and that didn't happen. And uh, and then the flight schedule comes out, and Bing put me on the first go. I literally got like four hours sleep. And I'm like, Bing, what are you doing? And he's like, it's the only place I can fit in, man. Sorry. <laughs> Five hours later, I, I was briefing briefing for my next go. So, yeah. Buddy's only half a word, right? <laughs> we, we, we treated you guys like heroes when you walked into the red room, right? I mean, your squadron mates, you know, adoration and... Yeah, I, I, don't I don't remember that part too well. I don't know. Oh, I'm that. sure. I think at that point your body had already hit the rack and went, oh, that's over with. <laughs> Welcome home, guys. See ya. Oh, man, that's funny. I, the XO did come in, though, and say, hey, you guys got to go down to medical and get blood. So Really? Because yeah. we had had a mishap. Yeah. A class B mishap, probably. Mm. So I remember that. Or he was just seeing if there was any alcohol content in the blood, but I don't know. So, <laughs> anyway, so that brings up a good point. So it, it's a it's a mishap. And, uh, you know, there's going to be a mishap investigation and a jag man and all that stuff afterwards. And in retrospect, you look back and you go, well, what could you have done differently to have prevented this scenario from happening? And my my observation is nothing. You did everything the way you expected. And you know, it was, you didn't know that you're going to get a foul deck. You didn't know what they were going to do to you. I mean, am I missing anything? Right. I don't ever remember anybody, a mishap investigation or anybody ever asking me any questions at all about it. That, oh, wow. Okay. I mean, good. I don't... Well, maybe, yeah, that's probably a good point, but just in general, I mean, you know, as right. I back up, I always kind of go, well, what could I have changed? And I don't think there's anything to so, change in that. So in terms of the mishap, maybe they, maybe they did it for the ship or something, you know, yeah. or what, who knows? Oh, cool. Well, what are you, what are you guys doing now? So now that you're, uh, you're accomplished, uh, you know, aviators, you know, you've retired, you've left, whatever. Rico, what are you doing these days? What keeps you busy? You know, I had been teaching, uh, high school Navy JROTC since I retired in 2007. So I've been involved in that. Uh, do your students know your story? Do they know that you have a barricade at night? They don't. I don't ever talk about that. <laughs> oh, they're going to watch this. Yeah. Hey, Crunch, I was a junior ROTC, Navy junior ROTC grad. I was telling Rico that earlier. I took Navy oh, nice. junior ROTC in high school. Oh, nice. Very good. It's a rewarding job. It's fun. And I told uh, Bio this earlier. I think I've got about... Uh, I've had around 35 of my former students have gotten either ROTC scholarships or or appointments to different academies. So nice, um, that's great. Been really really that's something. Job. Been a really good job. A lot of great kids. I still stay in touch with a lot of them, and uh, had lunch with two of them just this past weekend. Oh, that's great. Cool. Good for you. Cool. How about you, Pedro? What's keeping you busy these days? Well, wait a minute. Talk oh. about Pedro going to Top Gun. What'd you? What was your oh. lecture? What, when were you an instructor at Top Gun, Pager? Uh, 89, September 89 to September 92. And what were your lectures when you were there? Uh, the first one they got me on was Outer Air Battle. Uh, oh. And then I did Fighter Performance and Comparison. And then uh, finished up with Adversary 1v1. There you go. The 1v1 thing. Yep. Your whole career. Okay. How about in the modern world now? Yeah, after uh, after Top Gun, I went did, flew uh, adversary for VFC thirteen uh, till ninety eight, and then retired in two thousand one. But uh, I've been flying uh, airlines for the last thirty years, and uh, have a couple more years to go before they show me the door. Excellent. Very cool. Excellent. What are you flying? Uh, what what airplane are you flying now? Airbus, left seat of the Airbus. Nice. The 320 or a 330, 350? 320. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Well, that's what I'm flying to. I guess all my buddy right? passes have been getting lost in the mail, Pager. I don't know what's going on there. Your buddy pass has been ready, willing, and able the entire time, Rico. Come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Beers are on me, always. <laughs>
Hey, Crunch, I think we're uh, we're approaching the end. Uh, do, do you want to take another 360, Crunch? Or uh... Yeah, I, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. I, I think we're pretty good. Uh, and that's probably all we have. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for this. This has been incredibly uh, rewarding. I love hearing stories from back in the day of things that we never do. I mean, I've, I was an air boss, and uh, I had one scenario where – we thought we were going to barricade somebody and the decision was not to do it, right? It was a very similar scenario. Uh, did not end as nicely as yours did, I have to say. But it did, would not have mattered. Would not have mattered. The guys ran out of gas before they got back to the ship. So nothing oh, we can do about it. Yeah, it was bad. It was bad. But uh, that is not the story for today. So thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. I certainly learned something and had a lot of fun hearing from you. You know, you guys you guys are a case study of uh, of the benefits of all the training that we do and uh, staying calm and professional because, because when the pressure was on, you guys executed well and brought the plane back and survived. So nice job. Crew concept. Thanks for joining us on the F-14 Tomcast. Thanks, Bio. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Hey, so that was a great interview. And one thing I want to circle back on, in, in case you missed it, just because you are in a scenario that might lead to a barricade doesn't mean that you necessarily are. There are certain times where you might be able to divert. Now, every air wing has to get their blue water certification before they go to sea so that in the event that they are no kidding blue water, they can recover the air wing on board in the event of a situation like this. But if you have the opportunity to divert to a traditional airfield with one or two airplanes instead of a barricade or instead of an ejection alongside, most likely that's the path you're going to take. Now, there's some decision-making processes in there, but just so you know, the barricade is not always the answer for a low fuel situation. It's not always the answer for a hook slap. Sometimes you just divert and you change it out and you land like a normal airplane. That was great for me to go back to that that night in the Indian Ocean. I was there. I watched it on the plat and you've seen the video. And it was also great to have Pager and Rico dissect it, go into detail about their thought process, the things they were thinking about, what an air crew deals with and thinks about when they're handling an emergency. It just shows the uh, benefits of training and the uh, value of of teamwork. They uh, gave a lot of credit to the uh, people that helped them have a successful landing. So that's it for this episode of the F-14 Tomcast. If you haven't seen all of our episodes, be sure to get up to speed. And if you are all caught up, come back in two weeks because we have another great episode on the way. You've been listening to the F-14 TomCast, part of the Air Combat Experience, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at F14TomCast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101, extension 3. That's 877-622-4101, extension 3. For updates on this podcast and our other military aviation-themed shows, Visit BVRPro.com and follow the Air Combat Experience on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Thanks for listening.